Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Dan and Joe Sports Show. As always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe. All right, Joe, we got ourselves a very special locker room talk, and it's in response to the smack heard around the world. And of course, for anyone that doesn't know what I'm talking about, you have had your head under a rock, or maybe Will Smith smacked you, because everyone has seen it. I wasn't actually personally watching the Oscars, but the next day I heard about it, and it's been a big deal. And suddenly, you know, any co- any comedian everywhere that's looking for some kind of material has it, including poor ones like me and you. They're going to talk about different smacks throughout history and whether they're justified. And, of course, we'll talk about the Will Smith one. And we're going to go through time and take you on a trip of slap, smash, smack, smash, punch history. And as always, our locker room talk is brought to you by our fine sponsors, Hunter and Ginger Harrelson of Beach Ball Properties. The weather is starting to become absolutely beautiful spring weather. This is a great time to get down to the beach. The water is still a little bit cold, but actually quite refreshing. I actually went swimming myself in the Gulf over in Mississippi last weekend, and it was still a little too cold, but quite nice. And I think a little bit hotter down here this is a great time to have a beach getaway in Orange Beach or Gulf Shores and give beach ball properties a call and go have a ball at the beach. Sounds good. And one thing I was just thinking about real quick is I'm sure somebody said this, but all the comedians literally have a punchline with this story. Dum dum. How's it going, Joe? I like that. All right, Joe, let's start off with the topical one and let's look at uh, Chris Rock and Will Smith. And, and Joe, I've been battling in my mind all week about how I felt about this because admittedly, I'm not a neutral party when it comes to this. I happen to be a huge Will Smith fan. I like Chris Rock, too, but I've been a Will Smith fan pretty much my entire life. Uh, the first two CDs I ever bought were Big Willie Style and Willinium. I watched Fresh Prince of Bel-Air growing up. I may or may not have had Independence Day and Men in Black and Wild Wild West on VHS. I like, I like Will Smith a lot. And so when this first happened, I found myself giving him the benefit of the doubt even though he may or may not have deserved it. And, you know, I thought to myself, okay, uh, you know, this is obviously a very sensitive subject. That's a pretty rude joke. It is. I mean, you think about the fact that she's got a, 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 you know, alopecia, which is a disease that causes you to lose your hair. Uh, Jada Pinkett Smith doesn't have a choice but to wear her hair the way she is. And she's an absolutely gorgeous woman. It doesn't take that away from her. But, you know, of course, Chris Rock's joke is she's going to star in a new G.I. Jane 2 which, of course, G.I. Jane was a movie that Demi Moore was in in the mid-90s where she was joining the Army and shaved her head. And, you know, mm-hmm. so hey, you understand why this would be a joke that would be upsetting to, to Jada. Um, you know, what really made my mind up about this, though, today, Joe, was when I think about watching the video is that Will Smith at first laughs. You could see him laughing And then it's when he looks across the way from the table and sees the look of death he's getting from the wife. That's when suddenly, about 10 seconds later, he rushes up on stage and smacks Chris Rock. Chris Rock takes a second, then has a pretty good response, saying it's the greatest moment in the history of television. And then, of course, Will Smith starts yelling absolutives to get your wife's name out of my mouth, out of your mouth, et cetera, et cetera. And we go down this hill. And so here's my thought, Joe. I've come to a conclusion. And it is, if Will Smith had reacted right off the bat and not only just seen that maybe I'm going to be in trouble when I get home for laughing at this, maybe I would understand it. Not condone, but understand. But the fact that he sees this, takes some time, and then decides to do this as a CYA move makes it not cool, in my opinion. Well, a few thoughts I have, and, you know, I'm not an expert when it comes to like martial arts or fighting, you know, and looking at like the authenticity of this kind of thing. But there's a part of me that can't help but wonder if this was somewhat staged. And the reason I say that is, you know, we live in this reality um, TV style lifestyle. You know, we were talking about you know, before the show that everything on social media, you know, will react to things like this. And this is a perfect presentation for future memes are going to come out of this and i've already seen so much traction from that on the internet the other reason i questioned it dan was with the punch it kind of looks like he held up like i didn't feel like he delivered the blow fully 
And so something about it to me just didn't completely feel authentic. Well, I will say this, Joe. Uh, there's a lot of people I've talked to who didn't believe it was real. They thought it was fake and then maybe he didn't even hit them. Yeah, I yeah that's say, what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's interesting that you said that. I actually conducted a little poll myself amongst my friends, and there was an, it was close. There was a little bit more people who said it was real, but there was a lot of people, mostly women, that said it was not real. Yeah. Well, part another reason I think I, I wondered it is one time when I was in a play in the 10th grade doing some acting, we did a staged uh, slap where a, a, a girl slapped me on the face, and we staged it where I turned to the side and I clapped my hands. And it looked authentic, like people in the audience thought that she slapped me. But just the timing, once we practiced, you know, was able to kind of uh, conceal the real thing from happening. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, we'll say this. Will Smith is a very – he's a big guy, you know, and Chris Rock's, what, like maybe a foot shorter than him. And you yeah. kind of feel like if Will Smith really hit him, maybe he'd take him down. That's what I was wondering, too. Like, he, he definitely uh, recovered from it, like, really quickly, too. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, I think that it did happen, but I understand how people could believe that it did not happen. You know, and so that's interesting, Joe. I'll have to uh, I'll have to tell some of the people that said they didn't think it was real that you also believe that it was not real. I think that adds a little bit more credibility to it. I think it might have been staged, I guess, would be my final uh, hypothesis. So, would you say that it was staged to drum up more interest in the Oscars next year? Would that be the reasoning behind that? Yes, and to get more people talking about this year's Oscars, too. Because suddenly, you know, you have people uh, following the story that normally wouldn't follow that event. Mm -hmm. Well, and let me say this, Joe. Like, let's – we're assuming for, you know, purposes of this discussion that that was a real smack. Um, yeah. I think Will Smith coming out there and having his speech saying that you know, he won Best Actor for playing Richard Williams in the in the movie King Richard, which I don't know if you saw. It's a really good movie. Uh, of course, I'm a huge tennis fan, so I was really interested in it. Yeah. Um, he was saying this is very much like something Richard Williams would do because he was a fierce defender of his family. Well, you know, this movie got made a year ago, and as far as I know, Will Smith is not a method actor. You know, there, there's there's certain people that are method actors. Like Daniel Day-Lewis is a true method actor. That's why you've only seen him be in about 10 movies in his entire life. And what I mean by that, Joe, is that he is that character that he's playing in a movie every day of his life until the movie's done. He morphs into that character. If you saw Gangs in New York, he was Bill the Butcher for the entire time leading up to that. And there will be blood. He was the crazy oil baron in that movie. And they played that. My left foot, he sat in a wheelchair for a year, only moving his left foot. He's very serious about it. Now, it makes Daniel Day-Lewis one of the best actors there is. You could argue his sanity about that, but that's what he does. And But Will Smith, is he's a, he's a fine actor. He's like I said earlier, I'm a huge Will Smith fan. But he's not a method actor. So to me, that seems kind of stupid to say that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I just kind of felt like, you know, he didn't really apologize for it right then. And it just seemed kind of egotistical, his speech, the way he put it out there. And it just, you know, like I said, I, the more I, th I think about it, uh, I just believe that he was in the wrong and that nothing about it's OK. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's a, that's a good look at the Will Smith thing. Joe, assuming that Will Smith actually did hit him. What is your thought? Do you think that it was uh, it was okay him doing that based on what Chris Rock said? No, and in, in partly, you know, because I've never been someone that condones violence. Like, I really do believe that uh, you don't, like, you might in that moment, you know, get some satisfaction from taking it to somebody. But I think in the long run, there's always regret from those types of responses. Agreed. Well, Joe, let's look at some, some famous hits through history. And these are going to be ones uh, on the sports side of things. And let's start off with uh, Jawan Howard. It's the most uh, recent one outside of Will Smith. And interestingly, I've seen a, a meme that's been put out there that's pretty funny. In fact, my friend Kyle said it to me. He's been on the show before that shows Will Smith's face morphing into Jawan Howard and essentially saying, who would be the perfect place and person to play Jawan Howard in a movie? It would be Will Smith. They do look kind of similar. <laughs> that is funny. That is funny. <laughs> so – Looking back at what happened, of course, Michigan was playing uh, Wisconsin, 
and Wisconsin was beating them, I think, by like 12 points with less than a minute left. Wisconsin had their backups on the, the court, and they were about to, I think, have a 10-second violation, and the Wisconsin coach called a timeout to talk to his backups, um, you know, to try and make sure they didn't get this violation. And this really rubbed Juwan Howard wrong because the game was out of reach, and he found it to be disrespectful. And instead of punching, actually, Greg Gard, who was the Wisconsin head coach, he punched some assistant coach who has a name that's difficult for me to pronounce uh, afterwards. And what's amazing is that Juwan Howard is still employed by Michigan and that he got to coach and what ended up being a pretty good run to the Sweet 16. Yeah, yeah, it really is. You know, it kind of feels like uh, it was kind of surprising how the whole thing uh, ended up uh, being handled by uh, Michigan, but you know, kind of like uh, the theme we've talked about, some of these guys that have done things like this kind of staying on with the Cleveland Browns for whatever reason. It seems like Michigan uh, has no problem with it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, in my mind, like, I get that maybe you could be a little irked about what happened right there. But, Joe, if you're going to punch somebody, shouldn't you at least punch the head coach? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, it definitely uh, – the, the whole line of thinking there is definitely uh, puzzling. And let me say this, Joe. I mean, I actually understand what Greg Gard was doing right there. You think about it, your backups have very small segments of games that they get to play in. And Michigan's a good basketball team. And, and you think, I mean, most basketball teams have, what, maybe eight, nine players, let's say 10 tops. And so then you're getting into your walk-ons. And so your backups, you're only one or two injuries away from these guys actually having to play in a pressure situation. That's a good training time for them. And you want to see that they can they can beat a press, that they can get it across half court. I don't have any problem at all with him calling a timeout right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I get like it's a teaching moment. And, you know, a lot of times on senior nights, you'll see uh, schools like North Carolina will start their seniors that have been on the bench. And they may just, just play a minute, you know, but they're playing it the game authentically. You know, they're guarding people they're still playing the game of basketball. And I still see, you know, no reason why if those guys are going to get, you know, such a rare opportunity, why they wouldn't go, you know, hundred percent. Absolutely. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I think that that wasn't even worth Jawan Howard saying anything about it, to be honest. I think it was that little of a slight that he shouldn't have even brought it up. Well, from gamesmanship, you know, to me, I wouldn't want him to know that it bothered me that much. Like I think, you know, with your opponent, to me, it'd been a lot better just to move on from it. I think so too. Now I'll say this: you know what? That's great bulletin board material. You got some guys that are freshmen, sophomores that are coming back the next season. That would be something that I would highlight when I'm playing that week against Wisconsin. Be like, look at how much they disrespected us. They wanted to keep beating up on you. Why don't you show them what real Michigan men are the next year? And that's a good way to handle it, I think, from a coaching standpoint. Yeah, w- within the program, too. I think yeah, within the program. Locker room, in the locker room, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think in the locker room standpoint, it makes sense. All right, Joe, let's stick in the Big Ten. And this is one of the most famous ones in history. And we're going really old now. We're going over 40 years ago to the 1978 Gator Bowl. Woody Hayes is, you know, I would say probably one of the top 10 most famous college football coaches of all time. Uh, I would say that he's the most famous and probably most successful Ohio State coach of all time. He's got, I believe, I looked at it earlier, like five national championships you can attribute to him. And Joe, apparently he was a very stalwart opponent of running the football, as most coaches were back in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And he was playing a Clemson team that was pretty gritty, a couple of years away from winning their first national championship in 1981 under Danny Ford, had a very solid run defense, and suddenly he was having to have his quarterback uh, by the name of Schlichter having to throw the ball. And Schlichter was having a great game, Joe. He was, I think he was like 17 of 20, but it irked Woody Hayes to no, to no avail that he had to, he had to throw the ball to get back in it. I think Clemson had gotten up to like a 17 to nothing lead. And Ohio State on the arm of Schlichter had gotten back into the game and it was 17 to 15. Ohio State was driving with a chance to win the game and Schlichter threw an interception to Charlie Bauman of Clemson. Charlie Bauman returns the ball 65 yards and gets pushed out of bounds. And so, of course, you know, there's uh, one of the great sayings in college football and all football is when you run the ball, only one bad thing can happen. That is, you fumble it. When you pass the ball, there's two bad things that can happen. 
you can have an interception, you can have an incomplete pass. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Woody Hayes was so upset that, you know, he had to throw the ball, and then, boom, one of the things he fears most about throwing the football happens, and the game's over. This this is going to be it. So, Charlie Bauman returns at 65 yards, gets pushed out of bounds right next to Woody Hayes, and Woody Hayes decks him, punches him right there on the sidelines, a uh, college player from Clemson, and even with all of Woody Hayes' national championships, that one was enough to go ahead and get him fired. That's pretty insane. I'd kind of forgotten about that one until you referenced it, and that's just an unbelievable story. It really is. I mean, I can't even imagine what would happen. Yeah, this is you know, this is just covered in newspapers. I think there's video of it. I'm pretty sure I've seen a video of this before. But, you know, there's not all the angles you could have now. I mean, nowadays this happened. Every single player that was on Ohio State would be tweeting about all the Clemson players would. You know, if it's Clemson, you know, Dabo would have something to say about this. Like, I mean, it would be – it'd be nuts. Yeah, they'd be like a 30 for 30 just on that game and that incident. Absolutely. And, I mean, of course, Joe, as bad as the Juwan Howard one is, this one actually is worse. And there's an argument for Jawan Howard keeping his job. There, of course, was no argument at all for Woody Hayes keeping his job after this. And we definitely fulfilled our Ohio State-Michigan rival, rivalry quota by, you know, going after both schools as far as uh, criticisms. That's true. There, there is no, uh, there's no favoritism on the show between Ohio State and Michigan, especially when it comes to bunches. They were both wrong. Mm-hmm. Right. All right, Joe, next one we have, and I'm going to let you kind of take the lead on this one. I remembered it, but you got a little more uh, detail about it. This was, of course, famed Oregon running back LeGarrette Blount, who had a lot of troubles in college with the law and with what we're about to talk about now. But when he went to the NFL, he actually had a surprisingly good career that I never thought would take off because I always imagined he probably would have ended up in jail. Uh, but he actually, you know, like I said, played for a lot of teams and was a very successful running back, I think, by most standards. But why don't you tell us about what happened that ill-fated, Ill-fated day when he played Boise State? Yeah, so it was back in 2009, the season opener, and Boise State defeated Oregon at Boise State. And apparently the year before that, the two schools had faced off in Eugene in a game also won by Boise State. And Garrett Blunt went on record after that game and coming up to the season opener in 2009 – saying, I think, repeatedly that, you know, he owed it to um, Boise State to get redemption, to win the rematch and said something like, you know, they, they, he owed them a whooping or something like that. And so in the closing seconds of the uh, loss in the season opener of 2009, uh, one of the Boise State players could not resist uh, saying to Blunt, you know, uh, well, how, how's that for a whooping? And so in response, you know, we saw what happened with the punch from a, uh, LeGarrett Blunt, he was basically what suspended, I think, just about that entire season. Maybe he uh, came back at the end of the season. And let me say this, Joe. Of course, we're dealing with, you know, Woody Hayes. He was a 65-year-old man. Will Smith is in his 50s. Jawan Howard is in his mid-40s. But LeGarrett Blunt definitely had the best punch out of all of them because if I remember correctly, that dude did get laid out. I think he may have even been wearing a helmet, and LeGarrett Blunt took him down to the ground. It was, it was quite a punch. And, and he was, you know, young too. Like he, you know, we're talking about a twenty or twenty-one year old compared to all these, you know, really grown men. If you know what I mean, maturity. Yeah, he's a very mature man. And the Garrett Blunt, of course, is in the prime of his physical health at that point. But yeah, he took that guy down. And let me say this, Joe: it's definitely not justified. But I will say, out of all the ones we've had so far, you could have seen this one coming, maybe more than the rest of them. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you could definitely see how it could happen. You think that Boise State guy afterward was like, hmm, maybe I should have seen that coming when I said that. <laughs> I'm probably so. I mean, I, like I said, definitely not condoned, but definitely think that Boise State kind of player pretty much set himself up to have that happen. Mm-hmm. But I've talked to people, you know, I never played uh, organized football as a kid. I played uh, basketball and baseball, but I've talked to people that have played high school football it's just amazing to me sometimes the back and forth that I've heard people report that takes place when they're shaking hands. You know, you see it on TV, and a lot of times you think they're just shaking hands, but it's my understanding that a lot of times there is some rhetoric back and forth. Yeah, and, and you know, obviously Garrett Blunt was, you know, trying to call a Babe Ruth-type 
shot before that game started about what he was going to do to Boise State. The game didn't go that way. And, you know, everyone, I think, knew LeGarrette Blount was a pretty angry guy and pretty tough. And so, like I said, I'm not saying the Boise State guy deserved it, but probably not the most advisable thing to say. Right, right, absolutely not. All right, Joe, now let's go to the the last one that we're going to talk about tonight. And this is, you know, kind of similar to what we're talking about. And this is also someone that's in the prime of, of their health and one of the strongest guys probably ever in the NFL. And we're talking about Miles Garrett uh, taking off his helmet and nailing, uh, you know, the former Oklahoma State quarterback, you know, with the Steelers. And now this one, Joe, out of all of the things that were said, I'm not going to repeat what was said, but he said something that you should never say to, to anyone. And he said that to, to Miles Garrett. And, uh, you know, this is one that I would say maybe worthy of a punch, but not worthy of Mason Rudolph almost getting his head caved in by a helmet because Miles Garrett, I mean, I don't know if you've ever watched videos of him lifting. I watched it when like he was in Texas A&M. He is one of the strongest guys in the NFL. And if he lands that helmet on Mason Rudolph's head when he's not wearing a helmet, Mason Rudolph is dead. There's not any, I mean, he's instantly dead if he hit something like that. And, you know, there, there's nothing in the world that justifies that. There's no word that you can say that justifies that right there. And yeah. so that was one where, like I said, had Miles Garrett punched him, I would completely understand it. Not saying I, I'm going to condone it yet again, but I'm going to understand that I'm not going to hold anything against him for it. I'm not going to even have a second thought about it. But that one, that one to me is assault. And to me, it's assault with a deadly weapon because of how strong Miles Garrett is. Right, right. And if that happens anywhere, you know, that's not a football field, I think the punishment's a lot different. You know, it's just something about, you know, different when you're um, playing a sport for some reason. But regardless, you know, that perception that we were talking about before the show, I'm still just cannot believe blown away with how quickly Garrett has moved on from this with his career, you know, continuing to play in the NFL. I mean, granted, he had a suspension, but at this point, you know, he's just kind of being evaluated just like any other player and just moving on, you know, with this contract and everything. Absolutely. I mean, you haven't really heard a whole lot about it since then. I mean, you know, people villainize someone like Vontez Burfecht, for instance. Did he ever do anything that bad to anybody on the football field? Yeah, n- nothing to that level. So it, it really surprises me, especially with Garrett being a former number one pick. Uh, I would I would have, you know, expected that story to linger more. Right. Um, you made a good point about Deshaun Watson with the Browns before the show that maybe you want to reveal, too, with Miles Garrett and Deshaun Watson. Yeah, yeah. It seems uh, kind of uh, surprising um, that the Browns as a franchise, you know, now have signed a Deshaun Watson to what that $230 million contract, you know, already having uh, maintained uh, Miles Garrett on the roster despite, um, you know, these, uh, these legal um, issues that both of them have uh, been kind of surrounded with kind of as, as a cloud. That's right. You know, in the end, OBJ was just too clean cut for him. It seems that way. (laughs) So I had to move on to the Rams. All right. With that being said, speaking of clean cut, we're going to talk about Duke and North Carolina and all the blue bloods and what happened over the weekend. We get back to our recap of the March Madness tournament. We'll get away from all these, these punches and all this kind of bad accidents and talk about Coach K and wholesome things like, Hubert Davis, Coach K, Jay Wright, all these great things in college basketball. And uh, you can tune in on the next episode of the Dan and Joe Sports Show talking about that. And uh, you can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at DJ Sports Show. And, of course, you can listen to all of our episodes on Spotify. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and see all of the new videos that we've had for episodes of the last few months. And as always, I'm Dan. I'm Joe.